Uh, so the topic of the talk is uh, microservices framework for real-time model scoring using structured streaming. Uh, my name is Vedant Jain, and I'm a solutions architect with Databricks. Um, so this was supposed to be a streaming track, um, and there are quite a few topics uh, in my talk. So initially, um, I would introduce some of the other topics, and then um, such as the machine learning, model scoring, uh, and microservices. And then I'll talk about how streaming fits in this um, architecture, and then end with a demo. Uh, so machine learning is basically machines that can learn from experiences. Uh, there are two broad categories of machine learning. Uh, one is unsupervised. So if you have a ton of data already and you want to just find some patterns in the data, um, unsupervised learning can help you with that. So for example, if you're a bank, uh, trying to figure out how people are using their credit cards, um, or let's say if you're a you know e-com retailer, you're trying to figure out how to uh, build a recommendation engine, or for hospitals, uh, you know to know their patients, etc. And then there's the supervised uh, machine learning. So if you're a human, you know human carries a smartphone. Smartphone produces axial data. Um, and the human indulges in a few activities. Uh, and then the human explicitly trains a machine to understand what activity the human is doing. And then the machine starts to classify or label data without human intervention. So this is an example of supervised learning. Uh, and this also can be ac applied across industries. So for example, fraud detection uh, uses that. Or even Siri on your smartphone uh, just learning little nuances in your speech and improving over time. So regardless what tool you use, um, your data scientist will follow these steps in order to train a machine. Um, and the output of uh, the process of machine learning is basically a model or a pipeline, which is a set of models. Um, and in the end, uh, you will basically uh, you know, serve this model out somewhere, which you can then use to score the data. And essentially, you want to make sure that your model is either improving over time or it's maintaining its accuracy. Um, which brings us to our next topic, which is model scoring. So scoring can be defined as the process of gener generating values based on a trained machine learning model. And historically, model scoring has been quite commonplace, um, even though we don't talk about it generally. But uh, it's been used for many, many years, decades, if you will, um, across industries. So for example, you know, propensity scoring, if you want to find out the likelihood of a user to commit a certain action. Affinity scoring, where you want to bucket similar users or products, et cetera, together. Um, others, as well as you know, credit scoring, which is a more common one, and anomaly detection. They're all examples of model scoring. Uh, but when we talk about model scoring in big data, we have a few challenges on our hand. Some of the legacy tools, uh, there were non-big data tools, don't necessarily are, able, are not necessarily able to handle big data or data at you know, scale or even fast-moving data. So we have quite a few challenges. So let's look at those. So number one is, is scale. So your data scientists, when they're building models as well as serving models, uh, they should be empowered with big data machine learning tools. Uh, you should be able to have streaming capabilities, that is, being able to provide these recommendations uh, in a streaming fashion. Um, and then the system should also be dynamic, that is, uh, it should be able to gracefully uh, respond to changing requests um, and you know, have things like uh, continuous process improvement and failover mechanism uh, also to, uh, you know, to isolate processes. So summing it up, uh, and I'm going to show you this in the demo as well. So I want to give you a brief background about what the demo entails. Uh, I, ha I have a machine learning pipeline, um, which I created using uh, a few CSV files. It was basically uh, 
sensor data from phones and watches. It's open, openly available data. So initially, I did some transformations in data enrichment. I cleaned it up, uh, did some moving averages, and then converted the data set. It was about 700 megabytes of data. Converted that into a single Parquet file. And then once I had the park, I did all of that using Spark. And then once I had the Parquet file, I used Scikit-Learn for building machine learning models. Um, used random forest classifier, did some cross tabulation, and then I had a second pipeline for k-means clustering. And I'll, I'll show you what all of those are doing. Did some hyperparameter tuning, built two pipelines, which I serve in two separate Docker images. Uh, basically, these are uh, pipelines that are deployed then in the cloud. And then uh, the models are served using uh, Python Flask, essentially. So this becomes your microservice uh, wrapped around the model. Um, so software that is built as microservices is decomposed into multiple component services. So uh, each of these services can be deployed independently of one another. And uh, these days, these services run in containers, and they're isolated from one another. And as a result, you get many benefits. Um, on a high level, um, you have a much more improved CI-CD pipeline. Uh, the code is organized around business capabilities. So you can actually deliver the code uh, much faster because it can be modularized. Uh, and then you don't necessarily need to coordinate with a wider IT uh, delivery function in your organization for uh, delivering the code. Um, and then. Uh, one big part is uh, that uh, you can actually deploy the code both on-prem as well as in the cloud. It's, it's agnostic. Um, and it's quite common uh, where enterprises want to use the scalability uh, of the cloud to deploy or to, not to deploy, but to uh, create these models. But they also have you know, secu security requirements um, and they want to preserve their intellectual property. So essentially, they deploy, they build these models, and then they deploy them uh, on premise. Uh, and microservices plays an important role, uh, role in that. And then finally, scalability and re reusability. Um, so it's easy to scale with microservices uh, on demand. Um, and then you know, there are a lot of options in order for you to integrate with third party services. And since the code is modularized, you can also reuse it across uh, many <coughs> functions. So in the example that I'll show you today, let's say you know, company A tracks user activity through smart devices and wants to provide tailored content uh, to the users based on their behavior or their physical activity. Uh, so this is kind of a classic IoT use case. Um, the physical activity of a human gets tracked uh, by a smartphone. This is translated into axial data. And then I'm going to have a model that is going to classify or label this axial data, you know, uh, like whether the user is biking or standing, sitting, et cetera. And then this gets fed into another model. Uh, this is what we call the activity score. It gets fed into another clustering uh, model this time, which generates uh, actionable insights and, and what we call an affinity score, so it buckets users uh, based on uh, their behavior. And then finally, essentially in this architecture, you can send this to you know, downstream, where you can provide you know, targeted content to end users based on their behavior. So essentially, there are three microservices in this architecture. Uh, you know, these microservices are deployed independently of each other. Um, and then you know, basically, you get uh, scalability out of this. Um, and, but the challenge is, like, how do you move data between these services? Right? How do you effectively move data between these services? And yes, you need a, a complex event processing engine in order for you to, to unify these services together. Um, and that you can find in Spark, which is structured streaming. Um, so what is structured streaming? Structured streaming is a high-level API that is built on top of Spark SQL. Uh, it allows you to basically unify uh, your computation, uh, so you can use this, essentially the same logic and the same queries on both uh, batch as well as uh, streaming data, and it supports uh, multiple sources and syncs. You know there are built-in functions, you know things for sessionization, windowing functions, uh, event time aggregations, etc. 
Uh, and then it also provides out of the box, uh, you know, some of the streaming semantics such as end-to-end, -end, exactly once uh, guarantees, late data handling. So, you know, pretty much a well-packaged uh, uh, streaming platform for you. But if you're doing machine learning in structured streaming today without uh, let's say microservices, you know, there, there are quite a few disadvantages. You know, number one, when we have to, when we create these models, uh, the, these models are basically meant for batch data. Uh, it's not meant for streaming data. So you need to create one model for batch and then one model for streaming data separately. And many of the models are not, uh, not supported. Uh, today's structured streaming only is limited to the models that are built using Spark MLlib. So if you were doing any uh, you know, streaming machine learning, you have to use, you're constrained to use Spark machine learning. Uh, you cannot bring in other libraries such as R libraries or scikit-learn or, uh, you know, Python DL libraries, et cetera. And then if you wanted to have a continuous loop, like uh, I was talking about how you want your model to improve over time, um, uh, it's not meant for, uh, you know, continuous learning. Uh, you have to essentially stop your stream, you know, have the new model ready and then restart your streams. So in short, basically just use, uh, you know, we solve this problem, all three of these problems and others get solved by using uh, microservices and I'm gonna jump right into the demo now. How do I get to the other screen? Um. Okay, um, great. Okay, so basically I have two notebooks here um, for two different services. Uh, the way the microservices Serv uh, microservice surfaces itself is through an advertised address, which is basically a, U a URL. Uh, that's exactly what I have here. Uh, so this service essentially it's a classification service that I've built using a random forest classifier. Um, so once I have the URL, uh, here I uh, define a, a user-defined function. It's, it's a UDF in Spark. Uh, called score activity. I got the URL from top. Um, I, defi I define what the schema is that the service should be expecting, um, encode the data, and then essentially I just uh, send a get request. Um, get a response, so that, that's, that's my UDF right here, very straightforward. I register this with Spark. Uh, now, when you're doing this, you also want to have some uh, logic for, for retries. So you can either build that in your application layer, which is right here, or you can also do this via cluster definition if you're using Databricks. So in Databricks, um, uh, in case you run a job, uh, you can actually define what happens in case the job fails. So for example, if there's a network error, this job fails, you, you can restart the job automatically. Uh, and then you're going to define, uh, or you're going to define the schema here explicitly, so that uh, you can uh, feed that to your uh, structured streaming data frame. Uh, now it's very easy and very straightforward for you to go from batch to streaming. So here you're going to say, you know, Spark .read stream. This is going to be JSON data, uh, and then essentially I'm getting this data from uh, S3. I'm streaming it in, but you can, you know, use Kafka, Kinesis, or any other connector. Um, let's run that. Uh, while the stream initializes, I have uh, 
a function, so you'll see the timestamp is in a format. Uh, it's in a format that Spark cannot necessarily understand, so I run a function, so I do some processing on the stream to convert the timestamp in the right format. And the reason why I do this is because when I created the machine learning model, I used moving averages uh, as, as part of my feature uh, data set. And so I need to calculate uh, the moving averages here as well in the, in the stream. Uh, so I need the timestamp in the right format. So what I'm going to have here is basically uh, tumbling windows uh, of the order 10, so 10 minutes. Um, and then it's going to update uh, every five minutes. Uh, and so with, uh, with streaming, I can actually define, um, you know, with watermark essentially lets you know how tolerant, tolerant you are in terms of late data. So I can, here I can say it's so if the data arrives one minute later, you should consider that. Um, and then I define the tumbling uh, windows as well. Let's go back up and see if, yeah. So initially, this is what our timestamp looked like. We cleaned it up, and this is what it looks like now. So now we can actually do some windowing. Um, and then once I do the windowing, I've defined the aggregation here uh, as mean. So when the windows get created, it, um, you know, it calculates the, the mean for that individual window. And then I, do a, uh, I create this as a SQL table, basically. It's a temporary view on top of the data. And that allows me to run SQL queries. So, Remember how, we, how I registered the UDF in the first step? Now that I have a UDF, I have the stream in the right format, I can just run this UDF, uh, which will basically call out to my microservice and give me the prediction and the probability right here. So while it does that, um, essentially I want to you know, break this up um, into, uh, you know, uh, flatten uh, the data out so I can feed it forward to another service. And I can daisy chain as many services as I want. Uh, so this is exactly what I do. The uh, response that I get is in the, uh, is in a JSON format. So as you saw earlier, it was uh, prediction and probability in a JSON format. And I'm going to basically break that down into two different columns. Uh, once I've done that, I want to do some, I'm going to do some further aggregation before I feed it to my second microservice. Uh, so essentially what we've done here so far is that we've calculated or classified uh, what the user was doing uh, as the data, as you know, he was carrying a smartphone, uh, and we were tracking what the user is doing uh, with this service. And essentially, I can write this out to a parquet table. Um, and now I can feed it to my next microservice, which is I'm going to classify users based on their activity. And I'm going to bucket them using a clustering algorithm. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to use cross-tabulation uh, to clean up the data. So this is an example of how you can go from batch to stream and streaming to batch while you're uh, staying in the Spark framework. Um, and uh, I can do some cleaning up the, of, of the data. Uh, you, know, you don't necessarily want to feed the same data to the microservices. Uh, so I can clean that data up in a scalable fashion using Spark. And then I can feed it to the second, uh, second uh, microservice. So here I'm basically calculating uh, the cross tab. It's like pivoting uh, your data. Um, and once I've done that, I can read it in. Um, and then I'm going to define my second function, which is clustering users. And that is also doing exactly the same thing. I grab the URL from the top, where I've defined it here. This is the advertised address. Um, and I'm going to send this data. So if you remember the previous um, microservice, uh, now I'm going to send this data down to uh, my second microservice, which is cluster users. And that's what this function is called. And now I get a response. And I don't have much data, so it's going to bucket all of them in the same category now, uh, for now. Uh, but essentially, I get uh, you know, the 
what, what bucket or what cluster does, do all these users belong to. Okay, um, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so thanks. Uh, how do you manage the deployment of like versioning of of replacing your uh, your program? You call it mi microservice, but it's not actually uh, it's not wrapped by a container or something or that you can uh, deploy with Kubernetes or something else. Yeah. So these are basically just Docker containers, um, and I've uh, uploaded these models uh, into Docker and. Uh, yeah, once you have Docker, you can use Kubernetes. Okay. Hey, can you talk about the latencies that you have seen uh, with respect to different models that you have launched it for real time? Yeah, so the, uh, the latency, in this case, I don't have huge amount of data. Uh, the latency really depends on uh, you know your network uh, latency is going to be the biggest one because you're you know you may be go going across networks. Um, you want to make sure that your microservice is sitting right next next to Spark if you want to avoid that right if you want to avoid uh, cross rack uh, latency or network uh, latency. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is uh, depending on how uh, much data you use to build uh, the machine learning model. Uh, you know, once you export that model out in some format, for exam example, Pickle or you know, HDL5 or something like that, um, you know, your uh, it's going to take that much amount of time to actually score your model as well. It really depends uh, on how big that data was that you used to build the machine learning model. So those are the two uh, factors that are going to play into your latency. Uh, the good thing is that um, uh, with microservices, they they scale horizontally. Uh, so what you really want to make sure is that whenever you're reaching out uh, to request the response um, is that you're also, you have that endpoint available, right, uh, to, in order to not get a 500 error, ad, uh, you know, error code. So with microservices, you, you get those guarantees that whenever you are reaching out, you always have someone to respond, uh, you know, some service to respond to your query. Yeah, a couple of basic questions. So you have a Spark job which is consuming data from a stream. <coughs> How many uh, executors do you get? You control that, or it, the, the service decides somewhat, Spark decides somewhat automatically how to handle that? Yeah, so there are two components. So the, one is the Spark component, where we are doing our uh, you know, simple processing, right? So for example, uh, before I fed data into this service, I actually clean, I want to make sure that uh, I'm only feeding, you know, good predictions. So here I only, you know, I filter down probability equal to one. So here, uh, you know, this is all happening in Spark. And you can control that. So you can either, if you're using Databricks, you can use auto scaling to control that. Um, but otherwise, the number of executors may depend on, you know, the number of machines you have in your cluster. Uh, with microservices, when you're doing the actual scoring, that is done outside of Spark. So there's no executor component there at all. Okay. And when you go from streaming to batch, you have to decide the size of the batch you want to process manually. I didn't get it when you were, it's, it's a parameter you use, or how does it work when you go from streaming to batch? Uh, when I go from streaming to batch, um, so no, I don't need to define that. So essentially, I'm writing this out to a table. Yeah, that's what I did in the previous step. So let me take a step back. So this is exactly what I'm doing here. I'm taking my, uh, you know, the data that, that I got from the microservice, and I'm writing it out into an S3 bucket. Okay, and I'm writing this as a, as a stream. Now I can read it back in, in a batch mode using just Spark SQL. So I just do, I'm using Delta, Databricks Delta. I'm not sure if uh, uh, you've been to any of those talks, but essentially I'm using Delta where I can now take the streaming data frame and read it back in batch mode and do some, you know, any batch analysis. So in this case, I'm using cross-tabulation. 
And now I can you know, write this back uh, again to S3. And now I can read this back as a stream, right? And I'm using S3 just for convenience. This can be a message bus and you know, anything else. Uh, so if I got that right, uh, you don't have, uh, you're not using uh, um, like Kinesis uh, for, uh, for, the, for, the, for, uh, for your stream. Uh, could you give a little bit of detail about how the stream actually goes, flow comes? Yeah, so uh, your question is why am I not using Kinesis or? Oh, no, because uh, like, right now I am using Kinesis. I, I was kind of forced to use it. Uh, I didn't know any other way to create this stream. Gotcha. Yeah, so you will, in any real world scenario uh, where you are you know, accounting for latency, you will use something like Kinesis. So for example, whenever I do a read stream or write stream, uh, in order to avoid the disk-based latency, you will write it to Kinesis and not to S3. And there are other ways of optimizing uh, you know, speed with S3 as well, uh, such as using SQS for metadata, but uh, Kinesis will be convenient. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering how you passed the data to your microservice. Was that just via JSON? And if that's so, was there an overhead in taking data frames, coding a JSON in your microservice, expanding it again, back again, that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so if I go back to this one, um, I'm actually reading J uh, data in JSON format here. Um, the, so when I do a read stream, I already have simulated JSON data. Now, the thing is, uh, in most cases, if you're using web services or data, importing data in streaming fashion, you are probably going to get JSON data. Uh, it's, it's unlikely that you will not have JSON data uh, in this world. Um, and then I'm basically defining here the exact schema. So it's very important for when you feed uh, the data to your microservice that you know what the schema is, or the service knows what the schema is. Uh, so I, I define that explicitly. And then from there, it's just uh, you know, using URL uh, lib2 and requesting a response from the microservice as I pass this data as a payload. Uh, hi. Um, I have this question. Uh, are you? I'm here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, do you have any plans of uploading this to Databricks documentation, this notebook, for the tutorial? Um, yeah, or I will probably. Uh, this might come out as a blog or something, and, okay. and you can. So we it. can we can get access for this. All right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Any further questions? Yeah. Um, you, you have mentioned you're using Delta. Um, do you need to do any optimization, compaction, that kind of stuff in terms of the amount of data that you read in in that case? So in this case, uh, I mean, it's uh, about you know, 700 megabytes of data. So I did not really necessarily think about compaction. Uh, but as you know, you know Delta uh, does that for you underneath. So it surfaces all of those in a SQL API, SQL-like API, so you can uh, you know, define, uh, you know, say, optimize this particular directory wherever your data is being stored, uh, and Delta will take care of that for you. Yeah, in this case, I didn't have to do that. We probably have time for one more question, if anyone's got any. So in this microservice architecture where you split the, um, the two jobs, what is the advantage of having two separate Spark jobs rather than just having one which does both? Yeah, so uh, the whole concept of uh, microservices is that you want to m modularize your logic and divide it um, as much as you can so you can control different components separately, right? 
uh, number one. Number two, uh, I'm using two machine learning models that have been created by two separate pipelines, uh, in two separate machine learning uh, you know, pipelines. You may have uh, you know, cases where you have two different data scientists working uh, together, and you want to make sure that uh, you know, they're not butting heads against one another trying to, you know, uh, trying to build this pipeline. So you get complete uh, isolation in terms of how the code is developed, and then in the end, how the, co how does, how the code is de uh, deployed. Um, I could use one microservice for this whole thing, uh, but the problem that I would run into is that I actually do some aggregation. Sorry if your head hurts as I scroll down. Uh, but I actually do some aggregation between the two microservices that I, uh, you know, I calculate uh, uh, the cross tabulation table. Uh, you, you won't be able to do that just using the microservices, right? Uh, and if you have a large amount of data, that's going to be very challenging for you to do that. So wherever you can distribute your large-scale compute, you want to take advantage of Spark. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Vedant, thank you for a great session. Round of applause for Vedant.